Hi, I'm Kurt for the Ham Radio Village at DEF CON 29 in uh, 2021. And I'm going to be talking to you today about some of the equipment that we use for RF uh, testing and experimentation, uh, more specifically for ham radio uh, testing and experimentation. But I'm going to go over some of the more useful tools and some of the smaller support tools that we use for a lot of this equip uh, for a lot of this experimentation. So we're going to go over oscilloscopes, uh, vector network analyzers, spectrum analyzers. And then additionally, we're going to talk about some of the uh, other pieces that we use in conjunction with those. So signal generators and temperature controlled oscillators, uh, dummy loads, uh, attenuators. And then we're going to do some uh, experimentation or I'm going to do some demonstrations with both commercial and homebrew projects. Uh, and then I'm going to show you how to test an antenna at the end because uh, I think that's probably one of the more common pieces that we're going to need. Uh, but uh, let's start first with the oscilloscopes. So I'm going to uh, reset up and we'll get started on oscilloscopes. Okay, so uh, we're zoomed in on my table now. Uh, and what we're going to talk about first are oscilloscopes. Uh, so one of the nice things right now is that the cost of the technology has come down quite a bit. Uh, this is true for oscilloscopes, but it's also true for uh, all the rest of the equipment here. Um, a lot of the prices are much more reasonable now for hobbyists uh, to get into, so it might be the right time to expand your uh, testing and experimentation capabilities at home. Uh, and first we're going to look at oscilloscopes, like I said. So for many years, I used uh, one of these, uh, which is a, a mini pocket oscilloscope. Um, these are a few hundred dollars. Uh, they are a bit limited in uh, their capabilities, both in terms of speed and the level of voltages that they can measure. Uh, but they do work pretty, pretty decently for homebrew projects. And I'll, I will show uh, on here uh, with my setup right here, uh, a little bit of the difference between this and a larger oscilloscope and nowadays the larger oscilloscope is actually not that much more expensive so it might make sense uh, if you have the space uh, and a little bit of extra cash to get uh, a larger oscilloscope uh, but what an oscilloscope does is it measures voltage and time so uh, in our vertical axis here on the screen we have voltage and the horizontal axis we have time uh, so we can see a delta in voltage uh, and from that, the oscilloscopes can, can actually uh, do a lot of secondary derivative calculations. So this one also shows uh, frequency uh, and the period of the waves if it's in AC mode. Uh, and if it's in DC mode, you can also do very basic uh, circuit logic analysis uh, and things like that, depending on the capabilities of your oscilloscope. Uh, obviously, the more expensive ones can do more interesting things. So. What I'm using right now uh, is I have a, uh, this is actually a temperature controlled oscillator. Let me take this off for a second and we'll get a zoomed in view here. So uh, this is just hooked up to a nine volt battery right now. Uh, and this gets warm, this gets to be about uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And inside of there is a crystal. It's being fed by this little voltage regulator that I put in here. Uh, and then we have two different outputs on this one. This is uh, a, a harvested temperature control oscillator from, uh, I believe it's from medical equipment and a homebrew uh, board that someone made that uh, has two different outputs. One is an unbuffered output, which is straight from the oscillator. Uh, and that's the main one right here. And then the secondary one is it feeds that into a uh, chip a uh, logic chip, a five volt logic chip, uh, and turns it on and off. So you get a what they call a buffered square wave output. And that I have going to the second output right here. Uh, and this is just a 3D printed case that I made to keep it nice. And I've taken the lid off uh, so we can see inside of it. So what it does, what, a, what almost every uh, reference oscillator does is they, uh, they run at 10 megahertz. Uh, this is a standard for, uh, for, uh, for almost all radio and uh, 
medical test equipment uh, is their internal oscillators are set at 10 megahertz. So you can actually use this as an input to a device. So this this uh, uh, this oscilloscope doesn't have an input. It does have an external trigger, um, but it doesn't have an external reference oscillator. A lot of the more expensive equipment will have a, a port on the back where you can provide your own reference oscillator uh, from something like this. So what we're looking at right now um, is I have the uh, unbuffered output straight from the oscillator going into a 50 ohm load. And so the almost all radio and test equipment is going to expect 50 ohms on the wire. And I'm going to actually show you what happens when it doesn't get that. Um, but so right now we're, we're seeing a very small voltage peak to peak is 150 millivolts or 140 millivolts. Uh, and we can see the, the derivative calculation of the frequency is pretty steady at 10 megahertz on here. Hopefully that's coming through on the video, but uh, I can get a zoomed in video of this in a minute. Uh, and then we have the probe on channel one, which I have is yellow and yellow on here, is showing uh, before and after the load. Uh, so this is the differentiation of the signal that would actually be going through the wire. Uh, this is the difference in voltage between what would be the shield of the cable and the center of the cable uh, for if you're thinking about antennas and feed lines. So this is uh, unbuffered. Let me switch this over real quick so we can see the difference uh, on the buffered. Um, actually, real quick, you can actually see uh, the, the wave is not perfect. Uh, if it was a perfect, uh, ideally what we would want is a perfect square wave. Uh, but there's actually quite a bit of ripple uh, in this. It's not terrible, but still mostly square. You can see the trigger uh, on the, uh, if I adjust the trigger, you can kind of see it start to go crazy a little bit at certain points. So ideally you would want a very smooth square wave if you're gonna use this as a trigger. Uh, and I think this is actually a byproduct of the way the homebrew board is set up uh, to, to take the crystal output. I think we're not getting quite a 50 ohm, ohm uh, load output on it, and I think that's partly what's making this uh, look a bit uh, look a bit wobbly. Uh, there might be some extra capacitance or inductance on there, which we're going to talk about a little bit later as well. So let me switch it over to running off of the 5 volt logic chip. So this 5 volt logic chip is taking the output of the signal of, of the oscillator uh, and feeding it into the logic chip and it's just flipping the logic chip on and off at 10 megahertz. So right here you can actually see we're, we're way too zoomed in now. Uh, we're getting way more voltage so let me let me zoom this out. And here, uh, so this is the same time frequency but now uh, our, our uh, voltage frequency, we're seeing a peak to peak of 9 point, or sorry, 3.92 volts. So much higher voltage. We went from 140 millivolts to 3.9 uh, actual volts. Uh, this is still AC, so this is above and below uh, the zero point. Uh, we can actually see the wave is a lot cleaner here. Uh, you can also see the rise and fall time of the chip right here. So there's there's actually a bit of a slope. It's not. Uh, it's not perfectly vertical up and down. Uh, but you can see the wave is much cleaner uh, and our voltage is much higher. So this could be a useful uh, out, uh, input for uh, devices that can uh, hold that, uh, that can take that voltage um, and need a much cleaner wave. Uh, ideally, we could tweak this board a little bit and try and get the wave a bit cleaner from the other output. Um, so one of the things I mentioned was the 50 ohms. So uh, all of our test equipment and every radio equipment, uh, most sensitive equipment expects 50 ohms. That's kind of a weird thing. Why, why is there any load at all uh, on the transmission cable? Uh, well, long time ago, uh, uh, I think it was Bell Labs figured out that 75 ohms is best for receiving signals, that gives you the cleanest input signal, uh, and 25 ohms is best for transmitting a signal. So if you have a 
device that both transmits and receives, uh, 50 ohms is the best compromise. Uh, so some TV antennas and things like that will be 75 ohms, which means you have to be kind of careful when you're selecting coax you want to use for an experiment. You don't want to use TV coax because it might be the wrong, uh, the wrong uh, resistance. But uh, most laboratory and, and radio, especially hand radio equipment, is going to be 75 ohms. Or sorry, I'm sorry, 50 ohms. So uh, now what happens when we take our oscillator input and I'm going to pipe it directly in. So this probe uh, and this input here are very high impedance, very high resistance, which means you can put 600 volts on this thing and it will not, uh, it will not jump, it will not catch on fire, you will not break anything. Uh, and it basically is like a black hole inside of this box. Um, but if I pipe it directly out, if I pipe the oscillator signal directly into here, uh, it's not 50 ohms, it's nowhere near 50 ohms. So what happens? Uh, and I'm gonna zoom back in a little bit. Okay, so this is directly in, uh, and you can actually see the wave is terrible. So what, what is going on here? Um, this is actually representative of the civic signal bouncing back and forth along the transmission cable. This is something very important in RF, uh, and specifically with ham radio, we talk about it all the time. This is actually a, a visual demonstration of standing wave ratio. So this means that the uh, signal flowing across the line is actually bouncing back and forth, and you're actually getting reflections of that line. Uh, and this can actually damage your source equipment that is transmitting. So if you have a radio that's transmitting into a high SWR uh, transmission system, uh, you can actually get reflection back and melt your radio uh, or something to that effect or damage some of the sensitive electronics in it. Um, and so this is off of the raw oscillator. Let's look real quick at the five volt oscillator. Uh, or the 5 volt buffered. So you can actually see uh, it does get some standing wave, but it seems a lot less uh, affected by it than the raw oscillator. Uh, so that's an interesting property of running things through a buffered chip. They're actually uh, or using a, a digital chip as a buffer for these signals. Uh, it actually adds quite a bit of resilience to the sensitive electronics uh, inside the radio system, and it's a common, uh, a common tactic uh, that a lot of uh, a lot of RF designers will use uh, to beef up their systems. Okay, so now I want to introduce you to one of the homebrew projects that we're going to be using, and I actually have multiple versions of this. Um, this was a project originally published. Uh, by Jeff Anderson, uh, who is K6JCA, uh, and you can find uh, this diagram on his website. Um, and this is a very, a very simple uh, direct conversion Morse code or CW transceiver. So it sends and receives. Uh, it is very basic. It doesn't have a lot of filters, um, which is one of the properties that we're actually going to demonstrate with it. Um, and what I have is I actually have two versions of this uh, that I built. So his original version he managed to fit in a 9 volt battery. Um, so I have a similar attempt where I've got this on two boards uh, and all the equipment soldered on there. And then I have my original uh, prototype board uh, or perma proto board um, with all of the pieces uh, in through-hole design so I can get them in and out and some sockets so I can change some pieces out when I was testing things. And again, I'm using a dummy load and I didn't really show this up close before, but this is a, a SMA connector with uh, two 100 ohm uh, resistors split off the side and this gives us a pretty good 50 ohm load for very small signals. So, uh, Let's go through and do a quick, uh, quick demo of what this does. So, and how we see it in the oscilloscope. 
So, uh, oh, actually real quick, this is using a crystal oscillator. So this is at 7.045 megahertz, which is inside the ham radio bands in the 40 meter band, uh, which means we can, we can test on here as long as we're not causing harmful interference. Uh, and we're going into a dummy load, so this won't leave the garage. Uh, I'm not really concerned about it. So we're gonna hook up to the output here, and I've got a bunch of breakout pins to make measuring this way easier for myself. I did a lot of testing on this board. Okay, so this is actually my send button right here. So if you're thinking about Morse code, this would be uh, what I would use, a straight key to send dits and daws. Uh, it's not very, really very optimal, but it works. So uh, when I send on here, what we'll see, or what we see is a peak to peak voltage, about 360, 370 millivolts. Uh, and we see it's trying to measure the frequency uh, it's getting, it's jumping around between 6.9 to, or 6.99 something to 7.067, and it does say 7.042 a few times, so you can start to see a little bit of the breakdown of the derivative measurements on the oscilloscope. Uh, but what we do see here, oop, now we got a big jump in voltage there. Um, our voltage is jumping like crazy. Okay, so now we're actually seeing 5 volts, and then it jumps down. Uh, okay, there we go. So we're getting more stable. Uh, and actually, now that the crystal is warmed up, what we're actually seeing, or the transistor is one of the two, is warmed up, we're actually seeing between 4 and 5 volts. It's not very steady. Again, homebrew project, these things are very sensitive to environment and touching. Um, so it's actually stabilized a bit at the higher voltage. Oh, lost it. All right, there we go. Okay, so uh, you can see the wave is actually pretty clean. Um, it's bouncing around a little bit because the device itself is not incredibly stable. Um, but the uh, you can see that this sine wave coming out of the uh, out of the crystal and going through this analog circuit actually maintains its shape pretty well. We don't see a lot of the rippling or the squares that we saw, uh, which also means that this 50 ohm load is pretty well matched for uh, for the radio or for the transceiver for the transmitter, and we're not getting a lot of feedback or a lot of bounce uh, in the circuit. Um, but yeah, we can we can see even with the the everything warmed up and it's stabilizing. Uh, the uh, frequency calculation is not exact. It's a 7.042, uh, and it should be 7.045, uh, but it's not, it's pretty close. Uh, so let's look at the other version of this. So I'm going to take this off of here. Turn this off. Put this dummy load on the little. Micro one. Uh, this one is not going to have the same output level as the other one. So I'm probably going to have to zoom in. And I need, this doesn't have a button built in. So I have a keyer transmitter. I think it's this one. And I actually didn't bring anything out here to short this. And bring my key out here. Yep, there it goes. Okay, so we're seeing four volts peak to peak. Three point. And it's jumping around. Three point three to four point two. Uh, and I forgot what frequency crystal is in here, but we're seeing a similar jump around from six point nine to seven point something in here. Um, but you can see the the wave uh, looks almost the same. It, it's fairly stable. Um, despite the, or, or the, the waveform is fairly stable despite the instability of the actual device. Um, but this doesn't actually look terrible uh, for such a tiny device. Uh, but one of the things that you can't see right here, uh, because we're reaching the limitations of the, uh, the oscilloscope's use in this range, uh, is that <laughs> anytime you generate a signal, there's actually harmonics. So 
at two times the frequency uh, and at three times the frequency and at four times and so on and so forth, there are harmonics being generated by this device and transmitted out, uh, emitted from the device. Uh, on a commercial uh, transceiver, you will have filters above and below the uh, transmission point, um, most certainly stronger ones above than below, and they will be engaged depending on which band or which frequency range you're using on the device. Um, and I can demonstrate some of those, but what, uh, I'll demonstrate some of those later, but what we're looking at, or what I'm trying to show right now is that we can't actually see those harmonics being generated by this device with this type of test setup. Uh, and I'm going to switch equipment to the uh, to the spectrum analyzer, and we're going to talk about looking at the signals in a different type of domain rather than voltage and time. We're going to look at them in a different domain. We're going to look at them in frequency and voltage. All right. Okay. Before we move completely off of oscilloscopes, I wanted to give a quick comparison uh, of the micro oscilloscope versus the larger one, just in terms of what you can see on them. Uh, this is actually pretty full featured. It has a signal generator and uh, up to four channels in. It has two analog channels and two digital channels, uh, which is pretty full featured for a device this size and this price range. Um, but it is definitely not as sensitive as the uh, larger oscilloscope. Uh, but we do see you can Pull it, uh, you can look at, this is the, the 7.045 megahertz chip, uh, and you can see it actually picks it up just fine, uh, and it does a good measurement. Uh, you can't do derivative frequency or things like that on here. You actually just have to take a snapshot and measure it and, and take your best guess at what it is, but you can put measuring pieces on there, and it'll actually tell you uh, the delta. Uh, I can't do it while I'm holding it like this, but... Uh, you can move the measuring lines around and it'll tell you the voltage, uh, the estimated voltage and the delta between the lines. Uh, so definitely not a bad tool to have around, uh, especially if you can't fit a uh, full-size spectrum an analyzer or, or full-size oscilloscope uh, or don't have the room for one uh, or don't have the money. So uh, definitely a good tool to have around. All right, so now we're going to talk about measuring the signals in a different way. Uh, we're gonna measure frequency and amplitude uh, with the spectrum analyzer. So let's see if we can see this. So this is a very wide uh, view right now. This is all the way from zero hertz, which is DC to, we're stopping at 350 megahertz. This chunk right here, where it's super big, is actually the FM radio band. Uh, and there's a lot of FM radio stations, because I live in a big city. So those are very strong right here. So uh, all, almost all of the ham bands fit way below, uh, or the, at least that we're concerned with right now, fit way below on the left side of the screen. So we're going to have to change our view a little bit. And the first way I'm going to measure this is actually just with an antenna. I'm not going to connect anything. Um, and one thing you'll notice is that actually a lot of uh, a lot of radios actually have displays like this because a, a spectrum analyzer is basically the front end half of a radio. Uh, it's it's not uh, it's it's uh, detecting the signals. It's doing the signal detection, but it actually doesn't do. Uh, decoding or demodulation. So uh, it's basically uh, the front end half of a radio. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change the frequency and we're going to start around, uh, where do I want to start? We'll start around 6.8 megahertz and we'll go to 7.1 megahertz. So we get a a smaller band uh, that might be too small but we'll see if this works so the, the the way that this hardware is designed it actually doesn't do as well scanning smaller areas and finer detail uh, but we should be able to see so this should be at uh, 7.045 so somewhere a little bit to the left of the screen here or to the right of the screen sorry 
So let's see, turn this on. Oops, I'm gonna turn my power back on. All right, so there's our signal right there. And it actually looks pretty good. Uh, it's not very strong. It's at negative 78 dBm. Uh, remember that's millivolts. Uh, decibels is a logarithmic scale and, mil and we're using millivolts as a base. Uh, so this actually doesn't look terrible. Uh, but what we're not seeing when we're um, when we're zoomed in this far, let's go let's change the top end of this to be 15 megahertz. So now we have a big quite a big range right here. Now, so our signal should be way over here to the left, uh, and you can actually see it uh, is picking it up. Um, this type of homebrew project, uh, it actually emits some signal, uh, even though we're not powering up the transistors. They actually have just like a warm state, I think, that, that lets them emit some signal. Uh, you wouldn't be able to see it unless you're really close to it, but I've got this only a few inches away, so it can pick it up. Uh, so it's actually registering at 7.04 something, uh, which is where we're, uh, where our frequency is. But you can also see there's another spur right here, uh, and I think that's our harmonics. Let me transmit here. Uh, okay, so there you can actually see two spurs here. Um, they're not super well defined, so this thing isn't super powerful. Let me try and zoom out a little bit more. So let's stop this at 22 megahertz. Let's see if we can see. So it's actually not bad. Uh, at least, there we go. Actually, if I move it a little bit closer, you can see it a little bit better. <clears throat> uh, let me see. Range this a little bit. So these uh, spectrum analyzers are very sensitive. So now we can actually see uh, the second and uh, third harmonic here of our frequency. And uh, these are what commercial radios need to suppress. So they need to have filters to push them out. This homebrew radio doesn't have it. Again, we're only uh, emitting a few milliwatts here. It's not really uh, that much of an issue, but uh, this also uh, sort of gives some insight into where why the ham radio bands are spaced the way we, they are. So like 7 megahertz uh, is the 40 meter band, and then 20 megahertz, or 14 megahertz is the 20 meter band, uh, and then 15 meters is 21 megahertz. So those are all uh, harmonics of each other. And that's one of the reasons. So if you're ham radio equipment malfunctions, you're actually only affecting other uh, amateur radio enthusiasts uh, rather than affecting some commercial frequencies, uh, at least in a lot of cases. They're not all like that, but the, the majority of them are. So uh, this is showing, again, this is showing uh, frequency and amplitude. Bring up my notes again. Uh, so, another way that we can check, actually, um, we can actually use a shortwave radio. Oops. Uh, and you can hear that, but that's right at 7045. And if I transmit, the signal goes from, uh, it's actually still, if I move it close, you can hear that it's, i move it further away. Uh, the signal drops down, but then if I transmit, you can hear it. So if I take this up to 14, oh, we'll start at 1480, and we'll see if we can find this. So there it is. So there's the there's the harmonic somewhere around here. 
Uh, and sorry if that's obnoxious noising uh, or obnoxious sounding. But um, so there, that's that's another way to demonstrate um, that there is leakage on these other bands. And like I said, a spectrum analyzer is really just the front end of a radio. Anyway, it's, uh, it can be a little bit more sensitive. Um, but it's it's doing the same things that the front end of a radio does, the receiving um, uh, signal side of the radio. Uh, so another way to measure this, I'm measuring right now, I'm not connected to anything, I'm just measuring uh, with an antenna, nothing's physically touching, um, which is not bad for uh, for stronger signals or when you don't need things to be exact, but there's actually a lot of interference here uh, for... Uh, just from the air, right? Like you saw how much, uh, how many signals were here. If I zoom out to go, uh, you know, in the hundreds of megahertz, so let's go to 200 megahertz top end. Um, there's a lot of signals around me from, uh, from the fluorescent lights, from Wi-Fi hotspots, from, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots are much higher, but the, from all sorts of things, there's, there's all sorts of, uh, interference. So if you need to do a cleaner, analysis of a signal, um, you can actually run the output of something directly into a spectrum analyzer. Uh, but a spectrum analyzer has a maximum voltage and power that it can absorb. Uh, so what we need to do is we actually, even with something this small, we actually need to use a tool called an attenuator uh, to reduce the signal to a point that we're not going to uh, blow up our nice equipment. So I've got uh, several attenuators here. Uh, so this one can attenuate 10 watts of, of input power and it drops it by 20 decibels, uh, which is pretty significant. And then I've got smaller ones here. I've got 10 dBs uh, and 20 dBs. So these are usually 2 watts. Uh, this is this is up to 10 watts in. So this one I can actually use with, uh, you know, a 5 watt output radio, and I can drop it down uh, to something that's safe for uh, safe for this. What I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to grab some cables real quick and set this up, and I'm going to put this on the output antenna of our little test radio, and I'm going to put it directly into the low input uh, on the spectrum analyzer. So, uh, through the magic of editing, uh, you're now seeing another take of this, um, but the, uh, what I have uh, is I have the uh, proto board is going through the attenuators directly into uh, the spectrum analyzer, and I'll move this around a bit to try and fight the glare from the overhead lights. Um, and I've got the oscilloscope still hooked up just so we can see when the outputs happening and stuff uh, and what I've done is I've actually gone into the menus on here and I've turned on harmonic measuring uh, on the oscilloscope or uh, sorry on the spectrum analyzer so it'll actually tag not just the peak but the second and third harmonics or however many you're showing on uh, on the screen so right now I have it from 6 megahertz to 20 uh, it's actually up to 35 megahertz so it's a pretty wide range right now. Uh, so we should be able to see at least the first and second harmonics. Uh, so I've got this powered on. Uh, and if we push the button, it'll actually say, uh, let's see if we can see that uh, there's a peak and then a second peak and a third peak. And those are the first, second, or, or the, the second and third harmonics from, uh, from this device. And it, they show up right at the the place where you would think they would. Um, so it's, you know, uh, it says plus 7 megahertz. So it's, it's 7 to 14 and then 14 to 21. Uh, and the second harmonic is negative 30 dB down from the uh, original signal and the third harmonic is negative 34 to 40 down from the primary signal. So, uh, and this is important because the way that the FCC writes the rules, uh, 
your harmonics have to be a certain level below your primary signal. I believe it's like negative 68 uh, decibels or 68 decibels down from your primary signal. Um, so this is not really in compliance. Uh, you know, you couldn't sell this to anybody uh, or anything like that, but it's very interesting to, to test with and you can see uh, the extra uh, or spurious emissions from the device. Uh, and so this tool is really useful for measuring those and making sure uh, that you understand what the properties of the output are for your device. And uh, the next thing we're going to do is I want to hook up an SDR and we're going to do similar measurement on the SDR. We, we're not going to do it directly, but we're going to set up an SDR with a laptop real quick uh, and we'll look at that. So now what I've got is I've got my little Windows tablet hooked up uh, through a USB extender to a very inexpensive uh, SDR. This is RTL SDR. Uh, and I have it going through an up converter uh, that pushes up the, the frequency 120 megahertz. Uh, and that's because these uh, SDRs are not very good at actually picking up lower frequencies, the larger wavelengths. They don't do as well. Uh, they can do okay, but uh, this is a nice little device to have around um, for messing with the ham radio bands, especially since they tend to be much lower frequency than a lot of modern radios. And I have this hooked up to uh, just a very uh, simple random wire antenna that we're going to actually look at later with the uh, VNA. And I also have this running just so we can do a comparison. Um, but what you'll see, uh, hopefully it shows up in the video, at the bottom right here is there's actually a spectrum, um, there's actually a spectrum graph. It looks very similar to, to this. It's a little bit more detailed, obviously, there's more pixels here. Uh, and then there's a zoomed in version on this lower section of the screen right here. And so when I transmit, uh, where is it? Oh. So uh, this is picking it up. Um, and uh, so is this. There's the, the contrast isn't as great on here. I'd, act, I'd have to play with the settings to get it to zoom in. Um, but this is... This, this is what I mean when I say that the spectrum analyzer is basically doing, um, you know, the the same part as the front end of a radio, which is pulling in the signals and putting it into a, a format that you can start demodulating or inspecting. And that's really all this is doing too, is it's turning the uh, the uh, in phase and the quadrature sampling of the signal into sound on left and right channel, and then the software here is doing all the work to turn this into audio. Uh, the audio is coming straight from the software. There's no audio real output on this. Uh, even though it's sending uh, through an audio signal, it's actually not uh, what you would think of as an audio signal uh, traditionally. So, um, and you can actually see on here, uh, because the computer is doing most of the work, um, we can actually get a little bit more detail uh, and you can actually see that the signal is drifting a little bit as the uh, as the device changes as the device warms up or down, uh, or if I touch something, uh, it changes it. Um, it drifts quite a bit, actually. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah, it drifted all the way out of the range that we were actually looking at. So it's not, uh, you can tell it's not very great for a homebrew device, but um, the, the SDRs and the spectrum analyzer is very similar uh, in their functionality. This is obviously very limited to specific types of measurements that it's doing. The SDR is limited by how quickly it can sample uh, various frequency ranges. Uh, and, and at what resolution it can do it. And then the software on the computer does all of the more difficult calculations. So that's just a quick demo of using a SDR uh, in a similar way to a spectrum analyzer. Okay, uh, I actually was not done with spectrum analyzers. Uh, 
one uh, one important aspect that I forgot to talk about for signal finding um, is you can use a spectrum analyzer or any wideband uh, device that can receive the signal frequency that you're looking for. Uh, you can use a directional antenna with that device uh, to try and locate uh, to try and locate the thing by using the uh, directional uh, aspects of your antenna and pointing it at the thing that you're looking for. So uh, what I have right here is this is a passive loop antenna off of a AM radio stereo, uh, but it is directional off of the broad side of it. So if I set it here uh, on on the ground, it's essentially or on the table, it's essentially pointing up and down. Uh, and we're still picking up these really strong FM radio signals here at 103 megahertz uh, is the peak one. Uh, but if I pick it up and I turn it, uh, I know the towers that way. I'm inside a garage with metal doors and stuff, but the um, we can see that the signal uh, gets higher uh, that way. And if we're looking at uh, lower frequencies like amateur radio bands or something, we can do something similar. So if I go to frequency start, we'll go to, uh, let's go to 14 megahertz and we'll stop it at 14.2 megahertz. Okay, so now, um, <clears throat> this has got to come down. It's got to figure out where it is. Uh, so you can actually see our noise floor in decibels right here is about a negative 110, which is pretty good. So at, uh, usually I can find a signal here somewhere, but I am inside of a building. So usually at 14.074 is a uh, very common protocol uh, called FT8. Uh, but it doesn't look like I can pick it, anybody up transmitting inside of my garage. Uh, I might be able to get it with, uh, with the other radio. So let's, let's try something else here. Um, so like I said, you can use lots of different ways, but this, you can do this, uh, with a spectrum analyzer and you get a nice visual. Uh, again, we can turn on the, um, <clears throat> the waterfall, which might help us be able to locate something. Uh, you'll see at least a, a lingering visual representation on here. Uh, but let's try using a broadbanded radio. So I'm going to take this directional antenna off of here. I'm going to stick it on my little Texan uh, shortwave radio. Uh, and this one's nice because it has an external antenna port on it. Uh, and so I'm going to put this, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to set this at, uh, we're already there. So we're going to go to 14074 area. I'll turn this on and if I can find it, it sounds like modem sounds. If I can find somebody. No, well, I'm not seeing it. I think it's just because I'm in the garage. Uh, I can usually pick it up if I'm outside, so maybe I'll do another uh, quick shot of messing with this outside. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, uh, so a broadbanded receiver. Uh, this is a commercial one, a Texan uh, shortwave receiver. Uh, can do this. A Spectrum analyzer can do this, uh, and also, you know, an amateur radio that's uh, broadbanded can also do this. Again, you, what you really need here is some sort of directional antenna uh, that you know m most of the properties of so that you can use it to uh, sort of hone in on your signal. Uh, it's also nice to have a visual representation. This has a signal strength bar. Um, this one obviously has the decibels. Uh, some radios. Uh, or most most amateur radios will have a, a signal strength bar and S meter, uh, but you it also helps to have some sort of uh, visual feedback uh, uh, and or audio feedback to know how strong the signal is as well, uh, and that will help you uh, find the location or direction of the thing that you're looking for. All right. 
Okay, and last but not least in terms of equipment, we're going to be talking about a vector network analyzer. Um, now, a vector network analyzer is different than the other things that we've used um, because both an oscilloscope and a uh, spectrum analyzer analyze signals and active pieces of, of componentry. Uh, a vector network analyzer actually is for measuring passive things, so no energy goes into this device. This device actually generates output um, and then reads uh, back in off of its own output. So uh, we don't put any power into this thing or it'll explode uh, or you'll fry it basically. Um, and it, the display uh, looks a bit overwhelming at first, uh, but we'll, we'll walk through it. Um, but the, essentially what it's doing is it's trying to read the properties of whatever the cabling or, uh, you know, the, the, at least generally you can call it a network, the thing is that it's connected to. Uh, it's trying to measure the properties, the passive properties of the things that it's connected to. Um, so the, the pieces that we really care about uh, for RF and, and specifically for ham radio, um, we care about the resistance because uh, we want everything to be 50 ohms. Um, and resistance is actually not a linear thing in terms of RF. Uh, it actually has uh, capacitance, uh, can add resistance, and so can inductance, which is where you use an inductor or a toroid type thing, a coil. Uh, sort of less common in, in DC circuits, but a coil uh, also causes resistance and can change um, uh, can change the resistance equation of, of the thing. So this circular chart here is called a Smith chart. And right here is 50 ohms, uh, no capacitance, no, uh, no inductance. Uh, and it, it's, you have to calibrate your, uh, your, your VNA with a bunch of tools, uh, or with some passive component tools. I actually have them here. So there's a, there's a short, an open, and a 50 ohm load, and you use those on your ports here to, to calibrate your, uh, your 50 ohm starting point. Uh, so the Smith chart, uh, the resistance, this green line on mine, uh, will move around, and it usually will loop and go up and down and come back and forth, and we want to keep that close to the middle and close to this point right here, which is where it's set at 50 ohms. Um, the other useful things that we can get out of this is the log mag. Uh, so this is essentially the uh, permeability uh, is one way to think about it. So it's sending out a signal uh, and it, how much of it is coming back. Uh, uh, like, so a resonant antenna on a certain frequency, all of the signal that you send out to it, none of it should come back if you're sending out that frequency. Uh, and related to that is SWR, which is what is the magnitude of what's coming back. So these two are uh, not quite perfectly, but uh, almost inversely related to each other. So uh, what these are used for is, is measuring antennas, uh, especially for building and tuning antennas and getting them to, the, to be the most efficient for where you need them to be. Uh, and so we're going to look at... Uh, some uh, antenna components here. Um, so this is a nine to one uh, ratio uh, commercial product. This is the LDG uh, antenna. <clears throat> so this is an NFED long wire antenna or an NFED random wire. Uh, so the signal comes in here um, and then it does uh, some uh, basically transformer loops, uh, like you would think of like a power transformer, uh, but it actually goes short uh, right back to ground after it goes through the loop a few times. And this may look really weird to somebody who works on DC circuits, uh, but on AC there's enough resistance there uh, that this actually is the desired uh, pattern. So uh, the majority of your signal is going to come out through uh, it's faded because I had it out in the sun, but essentially this red port up here, uh, this black port is for a 
counterpoise, uh, which is not always used for a antenna, but it's useful for helping tune it uh, in the field. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to hook this up, and I've actually just attached literally a random wire. Uh, this is some harvested uh, Cat5 twisted pair wire, uh, and I am just I have no idea how long it is. I have no idea what this is going to resonate at or what the properties are. So we're going to take a look, uh, and hopefully it's interesting. So I'm going to put this on here, and so here we go. We can already see some interesting bits. Uh, how far am I looking? I'm, I've actually got a pretty wide range here. So we're going from 3.5 to 15 megahertz. So we're covering most of the ham bands. Uh, and across most of the way, it looks like our SWR is about two. Um, and our we're not actually emitting much <laughs> signal here though. So this is, this is wide banded, but still terrible. Uh, and our uh, resistance, you can see we're getting uh, at the point where the, the thing is right now is we actually have uh, 70 ohms and 520, uh, 530 picofarads, uh, so capacitance. So we our antenna is actually capacitive right now. Um, so there's a few ways that you can combat the capacitance. You can actually add more inductors, more turns to your toroid here. We'll, we'll sort of bring that back up. Um, but another thing here is that, that most people don't realize is that the ground is actually very capacitive. So if I actually just pick this up off the ground, uh, it's just dangling here, and hang it on something, maybe I can reduce the capacitance that way. Um, so yeah, you can actually see it reduced it a little bit. So the... So you can actually see how sensitive uh, some of this stuff is. So the touching, touching antennas, uh, moving them around, uh, actually changes a lot of their properties. Even touching this, uh, I'm adding capacitance to the circuit. Uh, your body is capacitive. That's why capacitive touch sensors work. Um, but we're actually only going up to 15 megahertz, which in the grand scheme of RF is, is pretty low. Um, so uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna change the stop marker. I'm gonna change this to just, let's just change it to like 200 megahertz. And we'll see if we see anything more interesting here. And wow, okay, so that looks a lot different. So you can actually see the, hopefully, let me check up there, yeah, okay. So you can actually see that the resistance goes all over the place. Uh, and this is the usefulness of the Smith chart. You can see it's actually going at various frequencies, it's actually going from uh, capacitive to inductive. Uh, and you can actually see that there are some interesting resonant points here, uh, especially over here, uh, right here, and right here. And I'll figure out where these are. Here's my little... This is a touch screen, but it's not the best touch screen. So somewhere around uh 36 megahertz 35 36 megahertz maybe we can get it down with this one there we go now we're in the hole 34.9 megahertz uh has a spot where we actually are getting uh 22 db of gain uh on the release of the uh antenna so it's actually emitting uh decently well right there and the SWR actually drops to 1.1 1 .1 to uh, to 1 which is really good so uh, so right at 34.9 something megahertz uh, this antenna would work great uh, or it seemingly would work great uh, the orientation of it on the ground because I have it just laying down probably actually wouldn't work great okay so then this is another point right here uh, we're at 176.420 uh, megahertz, um, and we have similar drops. Our SWR doesn't go quite as low, uh, and we don't have quite as much gain on the antenna. Uh, but it would probably work here uh, almost as well as it would over there. Uh, so this is, 
This is me touching it. Actually, if I let go of this, it might completely change the properties. Uh, it's not terrible. Okay, it did change it a little bit. It actually made it uh, quite a bit sharper um, on this first one. I can't quite get it in the hole. So it actually made the SWR drop almost to 1.0. Uh, and this one actually looks a little bit sharper too, a little bit deeper. Uh, so it's 1.2 SWR here. Uh, you know, this is this is a uh, rough measurement. Uh, like you can't necessarily trust exactly the numbers on here, um, but they do give you a, very, a pretty good indication, and they're actually more than accurate enough for uh, amateur radio purposes uh, and for most non-commercial purposes as well. So. Uh, but as you can see, the antenna itself is very sensitive. If I start moving the wire around, uh, I'm just gonna mess with it a little bit. Uh, it totally changes the graph. Uh, hopefully that's still showing up. I know there's some glare in here. Okay, so it totally changes the graph and then me touching it, of course, totally changes the graph uh, as well. So uh, it's important to, uh, with the VNAs to, Get yourself set up in a situation where you can not have to touch the actual devices, um, which is actually a lot of the challenge. So when you're creating a, an antenna, uh, let's say you're making an antenna from scratch, you actually want to set it up uh, in such a way that it's going to be uh, exactly where it's operating or in similar conditions to where it's operating. So if you're doing a field antenna, you want to uh, set it up at, on the ground, basically, or in the in the manner that you're going to be using it in the field, um, so similar heights, similar uh, environments around it, um, and then start tuning it because otherwise, it's not going to to work the way you think it is in the field. Um, and so, for the last demo, uh, I've got my helper with me. We're going to build a uh, a 10 meter dipole. Uh, and we're going to use the VNA to make sure that it does uh, what I think it does. Um, and actually, real quick before that, uh, let me just show you, uh, when you're making a dummy load, not all dummy loads are equal. So let's take this off of here. So we're going to stick this guy on here. So you can actually see that even though this is, should be calculated to 50 ohms, uh, depending on where you are frequency-wise, it doesn't actually do very well. All right, so uh, I lost a little bit of video because I ran out of space, but um, what we were seeing was the uh, this larger demi load is actually not very consistent. It's not very good. Uh, but if we look at this smaller dummy load uh, that I made right here. Uh, it actually looks very good, at least in the ham band range. And let's see if I extend the stop part out to 200 megahertz. Uh, let's see. So it's actually pretty good across the board. You can see the SWR is basically uh, it, uh, the, let me bring this up closer. I can move this one a little bit. Um, the let's see if that shows up. Yeah, the green uh, uh, resistance stays pretty much centered, so we're not uh, very high in uh, inductance or in capacitance. We can actually see what we got. Uh, it might be hard to read, but we've got a couple nano henrys, uh, four nano henrys of uh, of inductance here. Uh, the log mag is is straight across the board, and the SWR is basically perfect across the board. Um, now this can't handle very much in terms of power because uh, you'll just uh, melt these little uh, quarter, I think these are quarter eight watt, eighth watt resistors. Um, but this works very good for testing uh, small, 
uh, small radios that don't put out a lot of power, or if you could attenuate it even more before it gets to the dummy load, uh, that will also work. Okay, uh, I think that's it for uh, for the VNA and on the bench. Uh, but let's go outside and and build a simple dipole antenna, and we'll use the VNA to set it up the way that we want. All right, so we're out in my backyard, uh, so give the contrast, uh, trying to get everything in the shade. Um, but what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at two different antennas. One is I'm going to make an inverted V dipole out of uh, this BNC binding post connector and some cheap craft 26 gauge wire. Uh, and we're going to look at that versus a vertical adjustable antenna. Uh, this is a commercial antenna. It comes from a company called Super Antenna. And we're going to use, uh, I'm going to adjust this. We're going to use the VNA to adjust this. And we're going to get uh, to 10 meters, the same thing I'm going to build this, uh, this dipole with. Uh, and then we're going to compare what they look like. Uh, and I'll also show you the difference on a radio uh, so you can see what's going on here uh, and you see the effects. All right. Okay, so what I've got here is I've actually got this BNC binding post uh, with the wires connected to it. Uh, and I've got that connected to the VNA. I don't know if I can get this back on here. Uh, and the uh, one of the things you'll notice is I switched everything to BNC, so I put adapters on things, uh, just because I found that BNC tends to be a lot more forgiving in the field. Uh, you don't have to worry as much about breaking them and things like that. So uh, let's see if this shows up. There's a lot of glare out here. Uh, Oh, man, there's so much glare. Okay, so we've got, uh, I've got this way zoomed out so you can see more characteristics. Uh, 10 meters is really not the best to show some of the characteristics of these types of antennas, but uh, generally a inverted V antenna will have a pretty broad usability band uh, where the SWR is low enough. And I've zoomed way out to sort of show, and if I zoom into the whole 10 meter band, uh, the whole 10 meter band will be under uh, 1.5 to 1, uh, at least when I was messing with this a minute ago. Uh, but the antenna itself, like I said, is, is literally just wire uh, through the BNC. And all I've done is I've actually uh, untangled myself. Uh, I've actually started with the wire long uh, and I've wrapped it up around the uh, rock to change the, uh, to do two things. One, to, to plant it to the ground so it stays still. Um, and two, if you make a coil at the end of a wire, uh, it actually electrically shortens the wire uh, and it'll appear as the end of the antenna to, uh, or the end of the wire to the antenna or to the network. So this is actually very useful for adjusting antennas antennas in the field or when you're getting ready to cut them or whatever, uh, always start long and then roll it up on something and cut it uh, further once you know where you want it. Uh, but I've done this exact thing in the field and it works fine. Um, not on a 10 meter antenna. This is a little bit low to the ground. Uh, for an inverted V, this is a bit low to the ground. Uh, but this would work if you were on top of a mountain, like doing a soda or something like that. And what I actually have is I have a six meter pole uh, that I put uh, wire antennas off of out in the field. It's, it's like a fiberglass pole. You just string it up, you put your thing on the top of the pole and push it up. Uh, and that becomes your antenna in the field. So uh, that's really all there is to it for building a dipole antenna. Uh, every antenna has two pieces. It always has a ground plane which uh, comes off of the shield of the cable uh, and uh, an active plane, which is the center pin of your, uh, of your, uh, of your coax, the center pin of, of your antenna setup. 
and even in a vertical like this one right here this entire upper part is the active piece and the lower triangle see if that even shows up so uh, the lower tripod stand here this is actually part of the ground plane uh, and this interacts with the actual ground and we also have some radials cut to specific lengths coming off of here and so uh, a lot of times on a vertical antenna uh, where you have your active element going vertically you'll have a whole bunch of radials on the ground uh, to create a, uh, a better ground plane for it. So let's take a quick look. Um, this, it's set up, uh, oops, this stays here, it's set up, should be set up for 10 meters. Uh, so I'm going to take this off of here for a second. And I'm going to put this onto this antenna. So now we're measuring uh, the other antenna, and I didn't change I didn't change the zoom at all here. Let's see if that shows up. So uh, you can see that uh, the dip is in a little bit of a different place. So this antenna is electrically shorter because the dip is uh, higher. Um, when you're measuring the antennas, uh, a dip to the left at a lower frequency means the antenna is long. Um, <clears throat> a dip to the right, uh, to the side, means the antenna is short for your target frequency. So you want your dip to be right uh, on, your, on your marker, uh, on your frequency that you want. Um, and generally a vertical antenna has a narrower bandwidth. Uh, this doesn't show as much on 10 meters because this antenna is actually a significant portion, a significant size uh, of the 10 meter band. We're not actually using a lot of the loading coil. So I'm going to actually take a second and set it up uh, on a lower frequency, higher wavelength, so that we can see some of the, uh, some of the properties of the vertical a little bit better. All right, so now I've got this uh, vertical set up for 20 meters. and. This has a sliding, uh, a sliding coil uh, where the upper element touches the coil in only one place and you can slide that up and down for the connection. Uh, and it works pretty well, uh, but the main property of a loaded vertical like this is that it has a very narrow bandwidth like what I was saying. So now I have it set for 20 meters. And you can see how narrow and how deep that uh, that piece is, uh, or that section, uh, versus the 10 meter portion up here, uh, it was very wide and flat. I have not changed the zoom level at all. So this is the same scale that we were just looking at. Uh, so, but that is very common, uh, and you can see it's changing just because I'm touching the VNA. Uh, but if I touch the antenna, you'll get similar uh, similar activity on the VNA. So you, you measure this with everything sitting down, and you don't touch it. Um, but you can see how narrow that bandwidth is compared to uh, the wide uh, bandwidth that we got from the inverted V. Uh, and this is typical of a vertical, except this is at 10 meters. It's very close to actually being a wavelength of 10 meters without being loaded. Um, okay, so now let's see, let's compare what this thinks the SWR is to what the radio, uh, to what a commercial radio thinks the SWR is. Okay, so now uh, I've got the radio uh, tuned to the uh, to somewhere in the 10 meter band. It's not uh, super important because we're only going to put out about uh, less than half a watt right here, and we're very low to the ground, so I'm not super worried about interfering with anybody. Um, and uh, I've got the radio in Morse code in CW uh, mode, so I can push the button uh, and we can and send tones uh, and we can see what the SWR is uh, of the radio or the SWR that the radio sees on the antenna. Right now I have it connected to the vertical antenna um, and it's tuned for 10 meters and so hopefully show up. Okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to transmit and 
we can see that there's no SWR. So it's, it's basically thinking that this is a uh, perfectly good antenna. This radio is pretty robust. Uh, it's a field radio, so it's pretty tolerant, uh, but every radio has a limit on SWR that it will transmit at. So now I've gone and I've just uh, changed the coil position on the antenna to somewhat randomly. I know it's below where uh, the 20 meter sits, so it's not on a harmonic uh, of 10 meters. So we're going to try and transmit again. And now we can see the SWR is over three point something to one. So that's, that's probably way higher than you would ever want to transmit with. It's not going to break the radio. The radio might actually reduce its power around that level. Um, anything higher than two to one is probably not spectacular, especially for low power radios. You, you want to get all the power out into the, into the atmosphere that you can. Uh, so real quick, let, let me, I'm going to swap this over to the vertical here. Uh, and if you remember, the, the VNA showed 1.5-ish to 1 uh, on, the, uh, on both of these antennas. Uh, but the radio actually only sh showed it as 1.0 to 1, or almost perfect. So uh, they're not perfectly in sync with one another. Uh, and I don't necessarily know which one uh, is better at measuring. Um, but the radio is the one that has to make the decision in the field. So if you can measure it with your radio after the fact, uh, that's always good too. So now we're hooked up to the inverted V uh, and I'm gonna send, uh, this should be around 10 meters. So we have a little bit over, let's see if that's showing up, a little bit over 1.0 to 1. So this is probably 1.2, 1 1.3 to 1, uh, which is still perfectly fine for transmitting at. And uh, we can adjust it. Uh, you just roll up one side here and you can see, hopefully we can observe that, that the SWR changed. Uh, hopefully that was enough of a change. Oh, it's actually better now. <laughs> so uh, it's showing up as 1.0. Uh, so let me go the other way. I, I rolled it up. I made it shorter. Let me make it longer. All right, I made it about 10 inches longer. Let's see. Uh, so there we go. So now the SWR is closer to 1.5. To one that looks like it's shown up cool so that's a quick demonstration of tuning uh, an antenna uh, adjusting an antenna uh, with the VNA and then double checking it with the radio so we know that they're at least pretty close together if the VNA is showing that it's in the low 1.x uh, SWR it's probably pretty close uh, to 1.0 uh, or 1.1 ish for the radio uh, which is good. That's what we're. That's where we want it. Uh, we don't want any of the waves bouncing back into the radio if we can help it. All right. Thanks for joining me on this talk. I'll be happy to answer any questions in the Q and A session uh, or online. You can find me on Discord and all sorts of other places. Uh, but uh, we'll have links in the video description, I imagine. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me, and I'm happy to talk uh, about any of the the things that we've discussed uh, and any of the tangential stuff that you may have questions on. So thanks again for watching.